I get emails. I get a lot of your questions. Every day, I get new questions from amateur radio operators. And a lot of them start out the conversation by saying, I'm brand new. I know this is a stupid question, but I just got to get to the bottom of it. Well, that's what this video is all about. I've been doing a series. I haven't done one in a while. I've been very busy, but I'm back to it because I have found more time in my schedule to get back to what's important, which is helping people get started in amateur radio. What you can do is you can email me at josh at hamtactical.com. Send me your dumb questions that you want the answer to that no one's been answering or you just haven't been able to find it on the internet. So today we're going to go through a couple of them, and I hope you enjoy it. Oh, I love this first one. I'll mention the first name, but we'll keep the other a little bit quiet. Steve asks, hey, Josh, subject title, by the way, is Antenna for FT8. Steve says, I posted this on Reddit, but only received one reply to use a loop antenna and manually adjust with every frequency change. I tried asking on, on a Facebook group. It better not be the Ham Radio Crash Course Facebook group. And good Lord, the salty guys all told me to either raise a flagpole, which is not an option, or screw the HOA and sue the hell out of them. Also, not really an option. I'm hoping you might be able to provide some friendly guidance. Well, I, I hope I can. I have a QRP QDX transceiver on its way so I can see what kind of FT8 contacts I can make. That said, I'm a bit challenged with an antenna solution. I live in an HOA restricted community, so an external antenna isn't possible. My plan was to put an antenna in the attic, but after going up to measure, I found my space is more limited than I thought. I only have 24 inches of vertical height available, which is not a lot which means a vertical antenna is going to be very short, like mobile size. This is true. I do have a long horizontal run available, accessible, so I am wondering if an N-fed dipole placed in PVC pipes to make it easier to feed across the space might work. My third option would be to mount a vertical antenna in the garage attic, which is a 36 inch clearance available and run coax the width of the house to where the radio will be. And I am concerned I'd lose a lot of signal with a 45 foot cable run along with folded ductwork up there. No metal roof underlayment and no metal siding. Any thoughts on how I can build out a successful FT8 system? All right, so a couple of things up front, and this is also for everybody that will send uh, me emails. Make sure you give me all the details. The vertical height is obviously something very important for me to understand, but I kind of also need to know the horizontal length. Uh, horizontal length is going to be basically what's going to tell us how much of a dipole we can cram into an attic. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that an attic is a compromised location to put up an antenna. With that said, an attic is generally in your control. It's completely invisible to those that are around you, particularly those in your HOA, which is why you're considering it. So I would recommend building a dipole for the longest band that you can get up into that space. Hopefully 20 meters is going to be something you can fit, but that means you're looking at mm, 14 to 16 feet on each side of that dipole center connector. Now, if you have a bit more space to play with, I know you said only 36 inches tall, but if you have a bit more space to play with, you could potentially put up a fan dipole. And yeah, you could just have the elements underneath the 20 meter elements for 15 and 10, etc. But you could also explore switching them like a maypole, as a maypole antenna is sometimes called. Generally, though, that's a, an inverted V type setup, like a TP kind of thing. But you can have them going in different directions and, and they won't cause a big problem to each other. I would recommend that um, if you are going down this road that you at least try and make sure you get a 10 meter antenna up. That's going to be a very important band to you in the future in the next two to three years. So make sure you include 10 meters into whatever you're planning on doing. It's not going to be an all the time band, particularly now, but it's definitely going to pick up here in a year or so. So make sure you have that covered. Now regarding your garage, I'm not really opposed to you setting up an antenna in the garage either. 45 feet is actually not that bad if you're going from the garage to your shack. If 45 feet total, not a problem, particularly HF frequencies. I'd say up to 100 feet is not a problem. Just use some direct burial coax and you should be fine. 
Since you mentioned your garage, I might also mention that you can do something called an eaves antenna, a wire that goes on the backside of the eaves of your garage, and then you can use something like an external tuner or something along those lines, uh, a transformer of some kind, to make it work with your radio. People generally do better if the antenna is outside of the attic. The eaves are low though, so it's going to act more like an NVIS near vertical incidence skywave antenna where more of your RF is going up and then coming down. So keep that in mind. Also, you could take an end fed and just go wrap around the exterior of the roof and then use an external antenna tuner to get it into order and you would be fine. Uh, if you're going down that road, you'd probably want to look for something that is a non-resonant length or what's called a random wire antenna. It's not truly random. It's just not a length of wire that will resonate in the amateur radio bands. And then we use a nine to one un, -un or a transformer to bring it down nine times into something that can then be tuned with an external tuner. Now, last but not least, of course, for anybody that has none of these options available, you can always just set up a, an antenna in your backyard during the day, like a Buddy Stick Pro or a Wolf River antenna, or just build your own something off of a, a vertical antenna mask using a tuner or a transformer to get it in the air. And the downside of those is that then you kind of have to pack it up after the weekend or even after a day, and it's kind of a pain, and you start getting lazy putting it all down and dragging it back in and dragging it back out and putting it all up. Uh, trust me when I say there's a huge value to just being able to walk into your shack like I have, click a button and just be on the air. So thank you, Stephen, for your email. I appreciate it. I got another email from a Stefan, and Stefan uh, sent me a lot of stuff, but I'm going to kind of condense it down to the end where he asks his questions. But he writes, just heard your YouTube on stating a question area on Ham Tactical. So here are several questions and thoughts. I currently have been a tech since the 80s, and I'm looking to finally get my general. And he, he made a lot of statements, uh, a couple of them mentioning that back in the day, people were generally doing mono band, VHF, UHF handhelds for cert and other types of stuff. Uh, loves the FT60. It's a tank of a radio. I agree. And in my pile, I also have an ICOM R1, an ICOM ICR2. Plain English, are they worth keeping? I do listen to shortwave, but usually on other radios. The general questions from Stefan is, should I consider upgrading? As you can see, I have a, I have a lot from when I first got started in the late 80s and early 90s and not sure what direction to go, i.e. DMR? Question mark. Well, thank you, Stefan. Here are my thoughts on this. If your radio is functioning and you are doing with your radio the things you want to do, then there's not a really big reason to upgrade. You mentioned upgrading from technician to general, and so if you are upgrading to general, then you may want to consider looking at some of the new or even used HF radios that are on the market. As a technician and with a lot of your VHF, UHF gear, you may find that you're just not that HF capable at the moment, and so likely you will have to step into something that's a little bit more capable in the general frequency operating spaces, right? That's why you upgrade to general is so you get much more access to the high frequency ham radio bands, which is where a lot of those really fun, long distance, thousands of mile contacts all happen. Now there is no reason you can't just buy used older radios that have been lovingly cared for and are in good working order. However, there's a bit of a trade-off that generally exists with these radios. Some are not nearly going to have as good receivers as some of the radios we have out today on HF, and likely they will be more difficult to get onto digital modes like FT8 or other digital HF modes where a lot of that computer-to-computer -computer data transfer is going on. If that's something you might find yourself interested in, then you might want to look at the newer radios, uh, you know, like an ICOM 7300, 7100, or the new Yaesu 710. Many of those radios are all going to be just fine for getting you started on HF. Now I'm going to go back to the DMR thing. I know you, you're upgrading to general or planning to upgrade to general, so the, the DMR thing is something that you would do as a technician. I'm not saying you stop doing it when you get your general license. I'm just saying you don't need to upgrade to continue doing DMR. You can explore DMR now. You likely will just have to upgrade your radios to do so. Now here's the thing with DMR. 
If you have local DMR repeaters where there are people on those repeaters that you want to talk to or be a part of their system. For instance, Southern California has something called the PAPA system. It is a system of repeaters that have like-minded people that are preparedness-minded and they do nets and they do drills and they talk all the time on the repeaters on a myriad of different topics. If those are your people, if that's your ham radio tribe, if you will, then yeah, you'd want to get a DMR radio to go play in the watering holes where they play. If your local DMR repeaters are not a space that really interests you, uh, then that's not really something you have to worry about. Now, that's the trick of this whole thing is like, how do you experience DMR if you don't have a DMR radio, etc., etc.? Well, just look at the repeater listings in your area. If there aren't that many DMR repeaters, or Yesu System Fusion repeaters, or D-Star repeaters, then it's possible that the community is just not that built up or that interested in growing into that aspect of ham radio. So because it's line of sight, you can probably skip it. And of course, because this is a local issue based off of your local geographic area, you might want to reach out to another ham that's a friend of yours or a club and have a frank discussion with them on, hey, what's DMR like out here? Where do you guys go? Are you on a repeater? Do you have a repeater? You know, these are all things you can ask them and they're going to be able to answer that question in a way I obviously cannot. So thank you, Stephen and Stefan, for your questions. And for everybody else that is watching, if you have a question that you felt that, am I stupid if I ask this question? You're absolutely not stupid. The, all your questions that you have right now have been thought of by other people and ask in other forms. I'm just trying to use my platform to get those questions answered because there are no dumb questions in ham radio and I just want to help people out. I'm Josh KI6NAZ. Thanks for watching. I'm posting a link to another video that you'll likely like that may answer a question you've already been thinking about.